Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, my name is Chris Glass, and I'm part of the staff here at the Institute. I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome all of our students, alumni, faculty, board members, and most definitely our STEAM guests. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our campus, we are a graduate school of national security and international affairs focused on the teaching of the arts of statecraft and intelligence tradecraft. Last year, we celebrated our 25th silver anniversary. It is my distinct honor this afternoon to introduce Dr. John Lynchowski, founder and president of our institute, who over the course of the last 25 years has led the institute with prudence, unwavering vision, and a great deal of wisdom. Before founding the institute, Dr. Lynchowski served as the director of European and Soviet affairs for President Reagan on the National Security Council as well as special advisor to the Under Secretary of State. He is the author of several books and publications on the subjects of diplomacy and statecraft. And on a personal note, John is one of the most gracious men I have met while being sought out on the national level for his counsel. He nevertheless always finds time to offer an encouraging word, a nugget of truth, or making time to meet with a student. So would you please, with me, welcome Dr. Lynchowski. I paid him a lot to do that. <laughs> that, that, that uh, he's an expensive staffer, and he's, he's actually um, one of the great, great additions to our staff here. Uh, Captain Chris Glass is, is a uh, uh, truly a, a, an intelligence professional. Has been involved as, as one of the, in, in some of the most important work done in recent years for the Office of Naval Intelligence, and we brought him on board to help deepen our relations with the armed forces, uh, the agencies, and uh, and and the defense and intelligence contracting companies, and and so I. Uh, it's fantastic to have a guy of his credentials now with us. Um, I am just delighted to see you all here. Uh, this is an exciting day for us, and uh, I know so many of you who are studying here uh, have jobs and are busy, and you've got classes, and uh, and so to come to one of these uh, afternoon events, I know, is a, a special effort that you're making, and but. Uh, I'm, I know it's worth it. it it's my great, uh, let me just, uh, I want to just welcome a couple of special guests who are here today. Uh, my friend, a longtime friend, Paul Berkowitz, who is, was one of the most senior staffers on the House Foreign uh, Affairs Committee, uh, who has a great deal of expertise in, uh, in Afghanistan. And I'd like specially to welcome uh, General and Mrs. Jack Nicholson, Jack and Sophie Nicholson, General Nicholson, uh, who uh, has served our country in extraordinary capacities, happens to be the father of General Mick Nicholson, who is the commander of U.S. forces in Afghanistan. And General Jack is a member of the Board of Trustees of this institute and is one of the great stalwarts uh, supporting the national security of our country. and and peaceful relations with our friends around the world. Well, today I'm, I'm delighted to, uh, to welcome our distinguished speaker, His Excellency Hamdullah Mohib. Uh, Ambassador Mohib uh, has a remarkable background coming from a country, as you know, that has suffered an enormous amount of, uh, of, of hardship through continuous, continuous wars over the past several decades. Uh, he and his family fled Afghanistan during the Soviet invasion. Um, he uh, uh, and, and they, they ended up returning to the country after the Soviets were defeated. Those of you who have been upstairs know that we have a two or th probably four Afghan war rugs, at least a couple of which uh, uh, are uh, these are handmade 
uh, hand knotted carpets from Afghanistan that uh, at least one or two of them depict the Soviet retreat from Afghanistan, which happened to be a delicious moment for uh, those of us who were working on Soviet affairs. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, his family returned after the Soviets were defeated, but then during the subsequent civil war, the family had to seek refuge once again, in uh, this time in Pakistan. And along the way, uh, Ambassador uh, Mohib uh, earned a, uh, his, a, a degree at the University of Brunel in, in uh, England in computer systems engineering, returned to Afghanistan to become the chief of uh, information technology at the American University of Afghanistan. It happens the University of Brunel has a little connection with us here at, at IWP. One of our professors, Dr. Matt Daniels, has established the, uh, uh, the uh, centers of, of human rights and international affairs, both here and at Brunel. And uh, the idea is to promote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to study the role of human rights as a, uh, and the Universal Declaration as an idea virus that can inspire the younger generation uh, to, to follow those ideals rather than the false ideals that are promoted by the, uh, the, 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 the terrorists. And, uh, and, it ha it, and University of Brunel has more uh, Islamic students than in any other, uh, any other college in, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so it's 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 very we we have a little of this this relationship as part of uh, uh, a network of these schools that that um, and in these centers that that Dr. Daniels is establishing. Well, uh, after uh, his service at the American University in Afghanistan, uh, Ambassador Mohib got his Ph.D. at Brunel. And then later on, having served twice as an aide to in the political campaigns of then uh, finance minister uh, Ashraf Ghani, uh, the uh, Ghani became the, was elected president, and uh, and Ambassador Mohib became his deputy chief of staff, and then shortly thereafter was appointed ambassador to the United States. Uh, he is a great friend of America. Uh, he has been uh, active amongst the, 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 the global Afghan community, founding the largest Afghan diaspora youth association in Europe and the Afghan Students Association in, in the UK. And uh, he is working very closely with us on trying to secure uh, the future of his country. And so it's a, a great a great pleasure and an honor for us to have you here, Mr. Ambassador, and the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Luzonski, uh, for your kind invitation, and it's a it's a pleasure and an honor to be to be speaking at the Institute of World Politics. Um, it's more relevant today than ever, I think, uh, to promote realism about the world to develop skills in dealing with the realities, um, to inspire proper understanding of why we conduct uh, national security policy, and to develop the capacity for moral relationships. In this uh, new era, an era in which the world order that was established uh, after the World War II is now not just under threat, but being actively dismantled. The world stage needs capable actors who understand the importance of protecting the essential foundation of civilization, rule of law, national sovereignty, democratic institutions, human rights, and multilateral understanding and agreements. So all of you have my admiration for choosing to follow the path to study here at IWP that will prepare you for important careers in statecraft, national security, and international affairs. In that spirit, my remarks this evening are about something I think will resonate with anyone who follows geopolitics in my part of the world, the Af Afghanistan-Pakistan region. 
The Western media often criticizes the war in Afghanistan as America's longest war. But there is a major misconception about what is happening that I want to clear up. What is happening in Afghanistan is not a domestic insurgency. We can no longer tiptoe around talking about what is at the core of this conflict. This war is part of a broader fight, one against state sponsor of terrorism, a global threat to open democratic societies to the US, our allies, and of course to Afghanistan. A country whose ge geographic location at the heart of Asia, whose natural resources wealth, and whose massive youth population means it has a real chance at creating a brighter future for its people. Nations who allow terrorists to live, train, and plan operations on their soil unchallenged, and who provide or enable financing for terrorist activities must be called by their rightful name, the state sponsors of terrorism. Directly addressing the continued support of terrorism by Pakistan and the resulting consequences will benefit regional stability, the broader war on terrorism, and efforts in Afghanistan by Afghan troops and our US and NATO allies. Let's be clear, there would be no Taliban fighting for fighting in Afghanistan if Pakistan completely withdrew its support. Pakistan has set a precedence in its ability to support insurgencies without playing any consequences for its action. These insurgencies cost very little to sponsor, but cost tremendous amount to fight back as we have experienced in Afghanistan in the United States. This is a precedence for dangers world ahead of us. Other insurgencies have begun to find support around the world. They may be seen as isolated from each other, but together they make a perfect storm. This is a war where decades old rules of engagement will be impossible to enforce. Some of you may have seen the recent op-ed in the Washington Post by Senator John McCain and Senator Lindsey Graham. They warned of dangers of allowing the conflict in Afghanistan to enter a stalemate, which would provide Daesh an opportunity to carve out another haven for themselves. From this potential Afghan safe haven, Daesh could plan and execute more attacks. The senators called on President Trump on his admiration in his administration to see the U.S. mission in Afghanistan through its success. To treat the threat to Afghanistan with the same urgency as it is treating uh, the fight in Syria and Iraq against Daesh. Pakistan end this undeclared war on Afghanistan. Together, we have already laid the necessary groundwork to win this war. Internally, we will continue fighting the difficult battle of reform and attacking the ingrained criminal patronage network we have inherited. 
We need to continue support. We need continued support from the United States and allies to help us defend and build our country. The regenerative capabilities of terrorist networks are very real, and insecurity remains our greatest obstacle. But the will in Afghanistan is there with our strong government leadership, military capability, and the support of our people. But most importantly, with sustained U.S. support and a serious recognition and dedication to the eradication of state-sponsored safe heavens, I know we can rebuild, reform, and ultimately ensure the peaceful and prosperous future of Afghanistan. It will be a victory for our people, for the region, and for the safety of open democratic societies across the globe. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And let me just add one thing while um, General Nicholson's here. Um, we are grateful to, the, um, to all of the servicemen who served in Afghanistan in this war and this effort with us together. It doesn't matter whether they served in Afghanistan or in Iraq or any other part of the world where they're fighting the same war. It may be in different locations, but we really are fighting the same ideology everywhere we go. So.